Welcome and thank you for tuning in for the Lessons of Vietnam show tonight. We have a program I have been looking forward for a long time. Uh, the Lessons of Vietnam show is the telling the, the true story of the Vietnam War as close as we can get it. I'm your host, Bill Dixon, uh, Vietnam 67 and 68. Uh, broadcast courtesy of Nissan Communications from their world headquarters here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, for comments, suggestions, you can see on the screen there. Just let me know at DixonBill80 at yahoo.com. Uh, during the show, I highly recommend you write this number down and this uh, Skype uh, address because when the sh by <coughs> doing the show, you're going to come up with a question. I guarantee you're going to have a question, and this is going to give you a chance to answer it. That number is... 919-518-9773. Now, I know you didn't get the pen and paper like I asked you to, so I'm going to do it one more time. 919-518-9773. Or even better, go on to Skype and go and put in Computers 2K Voice. That way you can come in and ask questions and make comments and so forth because uh, our special program tonight, uh, you, I know you're going to have questions. Uh, the Vietnam War has been misunderstood, misreported, given misinformation by purported scholars and documentarians, sens sensationalized in movies and TV shows and books. All of this has created a public that is confused over the real facts as well as those who participate in the war itself. If you are not careful, your source and careful of your sources, uh, my tongue tied tonight, careful of your sources, you can find yourself exposed to bad, sometimes deceitful facts, questionable facts about the Vietnam War and the men and women involved there. Now, as we're going into this, uh, as you see there on the screen, uh, the Veterans Crisis Line, if you are out there and you know a veteran or you're a veteran and you're having some problems, please call this number. Uh, there's somebody there waiting for you, and you're important, whoever you are, wherever you are. Uh, there's better things out there. Just call and talk to these people. Uh, tonight's program uh, fits into the misunderstood, misreported, and uh, such probably more than anything to come out of the Vietnam War. Uh, we are very fortunate to have with us a man who was involved with the program as well as serving honorably in the United States Marine Corps. The program is the Phoenix Program. And our guest, Colonel Andrew Finlayson, who has been with us before, decorated Marine, Vietnam veteran of numerous, of numerous tours, author, educated, historian, and a man who has served his country in many capacities. And you can see some of them there on the screen. He went to Vietnam in 1966. He graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy. And then he served 25 years in the Marine Corps as an infantry officer. Uh, he spent 32 months in South Vietnam as a force reconnaissance platoon commander infantry company commander and provincial reconnaissance unit uh, commander and advisor. Uh, those were almost uh, totally different jobs. Uh, if you look at what he did, almost every one of them was totally different than the other one. His most recent publication is a book entitled Killer Kane, a Marine Long Range Recon Leader in Vietnam, 1966 and 1968, a little thing called Tech going on then. He's the author of several articles and studies related to the Vietnam War. Uh, you can see the uh, books there, uh, the Rice Paddy uh, Recon. There's his Marine Advisor uh, Vietnamese uh, Provincial Reconnaissance uh, Unit, the PRUs, uh, the units. So, uh, Colonel, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you get started on the Phoenix program. And, uh, again, out there, 919-518-9773, and I'll give you Colonel Andrew Finless. Oh, up to you. Okay, next slide. Okay, the, this evening I'm going <clears> to <throat> talk about a counterinsurgency program that actually worked. Uh, it's one of the few ones uh, that, that did work. Uh, and it worked despite a lot of obstacles uh, placed in its path by both American, South Vietnamese, and communist forces. And um, I think that uh, once I uh, uh, talk about this, you'll have a, a clearer understanding of what the program was really about because there are an awful lot of myths and falsehoods associated with the program, primarily because uh, it was so highly classified, and I don't really feel that it should have been. Next slide. 
these are the topics that I'll be talking about uh, this, this evening. Next slide. <clears throat> Prior to 1968, pacification in South Vietnam was fragmented, ad hoc, and poorly managed. There were dozens of American and South Vietnamese agencies and organizations involved with pacif pacification, but very little coordination and cooperation uh, was found between these entities. Added to this problem was a tendency to stovepipe uh, intelligence systems and for organizations involved to je jealously guard budgets and sources. The re result was a very inefficient approach. The CIA recognized the problem and sought to solve it through their intelligence coordination exploitation program in i -Corps, the five northernmost provinces in South Vietnam. The U.S. Marine Corps supported this concept and provided the initial funding for the program. The young CIA officers who developed this program in i -Corps briefed Robert Comer, a CIA analyst with a background in the Middle East, when Comer visited South Vietnam in 1966, and Comer was quite impressed with it. When Comer returned to the U.S., he briefed President Johnson on the I-6 program and recommended that it be adopted nationwide in South Vietnam, since this program seemed to work so well in the five provinces of i -Corps. President Johnson approved the plan, giving the U.S. military the lead, since the CIA did not have the budget or the requisite personnel to staff a nationwide program. The Department of Defense was rather tepid about the program, but reluctantly provided the money and personnel needed to take the I-6 program nationwide. An initial increment of 400 U.S. military personnel was given a year's training that equated to that which a new CIA case officer might receive, and it included language training and intelligence management. The program was implemented in 1967 in South Vietnam and was largely complete by the end of that year. By December 1967, Phoenix committees were established at every level of the South Vietnamese government. At the national and regional levels of government, the Phoenix committees dealt with policy. At the provincial and district level, the lower levels, the committees were focused on operations against the political leadership in the insurgency. The South Vietnamese government called the program Phung Hong, after a mythical bird, but the U.S. used the term Phoenix since it was also a mythical bird and it was more familiar to Americans. Fortunately, the program was almost fully in place by the time the North Vietnamese launched their Tet Offensive in early 1968, and the Phoenix committees were able to exploit information on the identities of many Viet Cong political cadres who surfaced during the offensive. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Next slide. Many Americans who fought in the Vietnam War were completely ignorant of how the communists were organized or how they operated in the villages and hamlets of South Vietnam. We were not very sophisticated in our appreciation of the enemy we were confronting. Here are some of the advantages that the communists had over us. South Vietnam had a Confucian social and political system that created a vacuum in the villages, a vacuum that was exploited by the communists. There's an old Chinese saying, the emperor's edict ends at the village gate. What this means is in countries with a Confucian political system, like China had for a thousand, for several thousand years, and the Vietnamese had for most of its history, it meant the central government only administered the government down to district level uh, in Vietnam, leaving the villages to govern themselves as long as they were loyal to the central government and provided labor for public works, soldiers in time of war, and pay their taxes. In a sense, village administration was rather democratic since the villagers elected their own village councils. Sadly, the Confucian system also resulted in a lack of social mobility for rural youth. Confucianism was a very hierarchical system, and this meant young people who were not able to, who were not able to assume leader, leadership positions in rural society. It also meant that if you were born a farmer, you'd remain a farmer, and so would your children. There's a lot, very little uh, effort, um, uh, opportunity for social mobility. Same went for fishermen, craftsmen, and other, other workers. In a Confucian society, women were also subservient to males, although many Vietnamese women controlled the family 
finances in rural villages. Young people and women often bridled at the restrictions placed upon them by the Confucian ethic. Another strength of the VC was they possessed a proven organizational system based upon many years of experience in both China and Vietnam. And I'll go over this organization a little later. The Laodong Party, which I'll call the Communist Party, was the only mass-based political party in South Vietnam. Other parties, such as the Dai Viet and the VNQDD, were urban-based, elitist, and very small. Even at their height, these parties never had an active membership over 5,000 people, and they existed primarily in the cities, not the villages. In a sense, the communists had free reign in the villages, since no other political party had influence in those villages. Also, because the rural pop population had experienced co colonialism under the French, they were influenced by the communists' method, mes message of anti-foreignism and anti-imperialism and Vietnamese nationalism. This was a powerful and appealing message to many rural communities. The communists had a unified strategic direction that reached down from the Politburo in Hanoi to the villages of South Vietnam. Party discipline was strong and party directives were carried out from Hanoi down to the, even the smallest villages and hamlets in communist controlled areas. The Americans never were able to deal with the communist use of sanctuaries in Laos and Cambodia and the enemy supply system using the Ho Chi Minh Trail. I'll discuss this a little bit more later, but it was probably the greatest strategic error of the Americans. The communist party was supported by a sophisticated and highly organized propaganda system in the West that had great influence among journalists, academics, religious groups, and anti-war elements. When I interviewed communist political cadres, they often felt that they had many allies in the West and referred to these people as, quote, progressive forces, unquote. Next slide. The Viet Cong enjoyed many advantages, advantages, but they also had some significant vulnerabilities which could be exploited. First, their supply system was both their greatest strength and their greatest weakness. It was vastly different from the U.S. system, a, su a supply system that pushed supplies forward from logistical bases. The communists used a very different supply system that was based upon experience of the Chinese communists during the Sino-Japanese War and the Viet Minh during the First Indochina War with the French. This involved staging caches of supplies forward along approach routes to an objective, using the party's finance economy cadres in the villages along the, these approach routes to provide the storage of caches and to build bunkers so mobile units could hide during the day and avoid a allied air power and surveillance system. Their logistical system was very similar to the one used by Napoleon, Napoleon and it allowed the mobile units of the enemy to move rapidly and covertly since they traveled lightly, unburdened by the kit carried by U.S. and Arvin units. However, it was also vulnerable since the Phoenix program was able to cripple the finance economy system in most villages, and this limited the ability of the communist mobile units to stage supplies along attack routes of advance in many areas of the country. I'll explain uh, a bit more about the finance economy cadres later on. They also had difficulty governing many of the rural population because GVN actions often resulted in the cadres remaining secret or living external to the village. You can't govern if you can't live in the village or if most of the people do not have access to you. Once the government of South Vietnam established a permanent presence in a village and provided real governance, the, Z the VC were at a severe disadvantage. Also, terror alienated many villagers, and I'll give you just a quick example of that. Uh, when I was in Tainan province, <clears throat> uh, the uh, people of Tainan in the Tainan city uh, asked the government to build a better marketplace. The marketplace was had a dirt floor. It had no cover from the rain or the hot sun, and the women who worked there complained bitterly about not having a place where they could sell their, their goods inside the city. Uh, using funds from USAID and from the government of South Vietnam, a, a large marketplace was, was made with overhead cover, cement floor, and uh, it was a, a much better place for these, these women to sell their goods. Unfortunately, because it improved the economic system in Tainan, the Tainan city, 
the communists were against it. And they sent out leaflets warning people to stay away from the market or, or, uh, or action would be taken against them. Most of the people had to use the market to sell their goods, so they disregarded this. The result was a communist armed propaganda team came into Tainan, Tainan City while the people were in the marketplace, and they threw two hand grenades into a small building that was serving as a theater where films were being shown to children and women. The result were four, four people killed, two women and two uh, toddlers, and a dozen or so people wounded. Uh, this turned the people of Tainan City very much against the communists for this act of terror. Taxes were a burden in VC-controlled villages. Some people were double taxed by both the Viet Cong and the government of South Vietnam, resulting in 60% of their rice crop going to taxes. VC taxes could be as much as 40% of a crop and were usually larger than a tax levied by the South Vietnamese government. This was a, a fact that was not lost on many rural farmers. A further problem for the VC was their village cadres were over-reliant on VC main force and North Vietnamese Army forces for protection. But that protection was usually unreliable since these units were controlled by Hanoi directly and were often moving throughout the country or periodically forced to withdraw to bases in Laos and Cambodia. The VC were unable to take and hold territory, making governance extremely difficult. They were never able to do this until large conventional North Vietnamese Army units invaded the South in 1972 and then they only controlled limited areas in northern i -Corps. Many villagers in South Vietnam saw the communist, communist promises did not match up with their performance. For instance, the VC did not build roads, schools, or hospitals. I saw this firsthand when I was an infantry company commander in Quang Nam province. On one side of the Vujia River was a refugee camp run by the government of South Vietnam. On the other side of the river were villages controlled by the Viet Cong. The differences were stark. The South Vietnamese refugee camp had a school, a health clinic, clean and neat homes, and vegetable gardens, clean water and electricity, they even had televisions. The VC villages were dirty, ramshackle and poor with none of the amenities found in the refugee camp. Finally, the Phoenix program did serious damage to the communist cadres and their attempts to control the population by neutralizing the Viet Cong infrastructure. The government of South Vietnam had some significant advantages over the VC. Phoenix program gave, gave the South Vietnamese government a unified countrywide system to combat the political leadership of the insurgency after 1967. The South Vietnamese benefited, benefited from significant U.S. and allied economic and military support. However, the U.S. was slow to equip the South Vietnamese uh, army and militia units with modern arms and equipment. The North Vietnamese Army often had better equipment and arms than the Arvin, to include the most modern Soviet and Chinese weapons. Pacification was enhanced by a significant increase in the number of district and village level militia units, known as the regional and popular forces, who provided security to the South Vietnamese presence in rural areas. Village elections in 1967 and the formation of a national assembly won over large segments of the population and expanded the base of support of the government. There was, however, a problem with the National Assembly. Like most democratically elected uh, uh, national assemblies, the kind of people that were elected were lawyers or wealthy people, and those wealthy people were landowners. So there was a tendency among the, among the people in the National Assembly not to take actions that help the rural poor. Although seldom mentioned in the Western, Western press, the government of South Vietnam had several popular government programs in rural areas, such as free schools, farming cooperatives, land reform initiatives, and provincial hospitals and district, district health clinics. Little known fact is the South Vietnamese government turned over more land to uh, uh, rural presence, peasants than the, uh, the communists did. Finally, the government of South Vietnam possessed a nationwide special police unit specifically designed to neutralize the Viet Cong infrastructure, the provincial reconnaissance units. I will go into, the, into these units later. The government of South Vietnam also had some really troubling disadvantages, some of which were never fully corrected. 
The murder of President Xi in 1963 left the country without a true nationally recognized leader. A senior communist political officer I interviewed told me that the American coup that led to President Xi's death was, and I quote, the greatest gift you Americans gave us. As I mentioned earlier, the government of South Vietnam left the governing of villages to the villagers, only, administ only administrating, administering down to district level. This left the villages open to VC control until the problem was recognized and, stepped, and steps taken to provide a government presence in the villages. The Confucian system limited social mobility, a key advantage that the VC took full advantage of. Their message to many rural youth was they would replace them in key positions within the party despite their age or lack of education. They told the rural youth that if they were loyal to the party, their loyalty would be rewarded with enhanced responsibility and prestige. This was a powerful message and was true to some extent that the communist system was based on a meritocracy. The failure of the Americans to cut the Ho Chi Minh Trail and deny sanctuaries to the communists was key to the ultimate defeat of the South Vietnamese. Despite warnings from both the South Vietnamese and American planners in the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the likelihood of eventual defeat of South Vietnam unless the French road system in the Pandanal of Laos was cut, the Americans slavish, slavishly adhered to the 1962 Geneva Accords on the neutrality of Laos and Cambodia and never occupied the choke points on the trail in eastern Laos. This was a cosmic failure and almost assured the North Vietnamese victory. I would also argue that the lack of an effective worldwide propaganda campaign, along with a hostile Saigon press corps and a well-organized anti-war movement in the West were severe dis disadvantages to the Saigon government. Now I'd like to explain how the communists organized the village in South Vietnam and why their system of control was so effective and difficult to root out. The party chairman was a senior communist official in the village and he was also often the village chief, but not always. The party secretary, second man in control, could also be the party chairman, but normally he or she was not. The primary qualification of this individual was he or she had to possess an education level that would allow them to read party directives and other documents and write reports. Since most VC cadres had an, on average only three years of formal education, the party secretary usually had at least a primary, primary education and could fill the administrative functions demanded of the village party chapter. And there was a great deal of reports that were demanded by higher communist headquarters. So this person was extremely important. The security section's primary role was to use the village guerrilla platoon to protect the Viet Cong infrastructure and to monitor the loyalty of other party cadres and the villagers. They only had a secondary message, mission, which was to install IEDs and harass American and South Vietnamese forces. Few Americans fully understand that the security of these, these local village guerrillas, their primary role was to protect the communist cadres, not to fight the, the American and Arvin forces. The finance economy section controlled the party's budget and finances, wrote reports on the economic status of the village, and provided valuable logistical support to Viet Cong and North Vietnamese Army forces transiting areas near the village. They were vital to the strategy of the communists because without them, the conventional Viet Cong and North Vietnamese Army mobile units could not operate effectively inside South Vietnam. The communists made an effort to win over both the government of, of South Vietnam's military and civil servants to their cause and had party sections devoted to this. The proselytizing sections, as they were called, contacted the family, family members of uh, Saigon soldiers and civil servants with the goal of getting them to defect to the communist cause or to remain in place to engage in espionage. The village organization was supposed to have a civilian health section which would provide basic health services. But in my experience and the experience of others, this, this section was seldom staffed. The greatest means of social control uh, in, in a communist controlled village was exercised through liberation associations. Just about everyone in a VC controlled village belonged to one or more of these associations. 
These associations were similar to the old system of mutual aid associations that provided low interest loans to farmers or to pay for funeral or wedding expenses. The difference with these associations was they still provided the same benefits, but they were all led by party members. In this way, the entire village population could be mobilized to struggle against the Saigon government. The communists were very adept at finding issues that could be exploited to the benefit of the party. In essence, everyone in a VC-controlled village was an instrument of the party, but only a few villagers were actually Communist Party members. Normally, party membership was reserved for only 10 to 15 percent of the villagers, and at times it was even smaller, as, as small as 3 or 4 percent. <clears throat> Most Americans who fought in the Vietnam War were puzzled by the appeal of the Lao Dong or Communist Party. They thought if the villagers were exposed to democracy and good governance, all would be right with the world. We had a very Western outlook, one very different from the peasant working his or her paddy fields in South Vietnam. I will now briefly explain why the communist message appealed to so many rural villagers. First, family ties had a lot to do with the hold the communists had on people living in the villages. Most people were related to each other, either by blood or by marriage, and this tended to unify the outlook of those who lived there, and family ties were extremely important to the average peasant. Land distribution was a common theme used by the communists to win over many peasant farmers. The Viet Cong, like their Chinese communist teachers, identified five groups of people in rural areas. They were absentee landlords, rich peasants, middle peasants, poor peasants, and landless pe peasants. And they focused their message to appeal to the last two groups. Of course, there were areas of South Vietnam where land redistribution did not resonate with people because there was no shortage, shortage of arable land in several provinces. However, in those areas where the population was dense and land sparse, this message was a powerful tool the communists used to win over farmers who were struggling on small plots of land or were forced to provide labor in land owned by others. The communists offered rural youth the promise of a society based on merit, not age or family connections a promise that appealed to village youth who felt trapped by the Confucian system. Nationalism was a strong incentive for the rural youth to join the Viet Cong or support the communist infrastructure. They would tell anyone who would listen that the Americans were just the French in a different uniform. The communists were not above using racism as a weapon as well. I saw many VC propaganda documents that were racist in the extreme. The communists promised a future that included social justice for everyone, regardless of age or gender. And this, prob and this promise had it as its base a st strong arguments against Confucianism. They also promised a more just economic system with lower taxes, a promise that often rang hollow since the VC taxed the villagers in the areas they controlled at a higher rate than the government of Saigon did. A very powerful means of controlling and influencing the rural population was the communist mass-based liberation committees, which I touched on earlier, uh, which the communists used to organize struggle movements against the Saigon government over real or perceived grievances. They called this struggle te technique Dao Tron, and they placed an almost religious belief in its effectiveness at mobilizing the rural population. Finally, they used selective terror against village leaders GVN, GVN civil servants, and even religious leaders. Non-judicial killings were carried out by armed propaganda teams, and they were always done to achieve a desired political objective. They were never haphazard, but well thought out in advance. In fact, in most cases, the authorization to execute uh, someone had to be approved higher than the village level, at district or province level, before it could be carried out. Every one of these killings had a political objective in mind. <clears throat> in order to counter the communist system of controlling the rural population and mobilizing it to support the communists, the government in Saigon and the Americans developed the Phoenix program. As I stated earlier, the program was organized in such a way as to mirror the administrative system of South Vietnam. So each level 
of administration had a role to play in the neutralization of the enemy's political infrastructure. Policy was set at the national and four regional levels, while the operational actions were accomplished at the provincial and district levels. This made sense since each province was different and the Viet Cong infrastructure in Viet Cong infrastructure threat varied from province to province. To give the program the political support it needed, each committee at each level of government was chaired by the senior uh, Saigon government political leader in that entity. For instance, the provincial Phoenix committees were chaired by the provinci provincial chiefs. When fully implemented, the various committees went about collecting and analyzing every source of intelligence on the Viet Cong political leadership from the national level down to the village level. While not uniformly successful, it was highly effective in those provinces and districts where government leaders and U.S. government agencies worked in close cooperation. In my next slide, I will explain how a representative Phoenix committee was organized. To do this, we'll use a typical district Phoenix committee, or as it was normally called, the District Intelligence Operation Coordinating Committee, or DIOC. The key to the success of the DIOC was it broke down the bureaucratic barriers between the agencies in the fight. And this allowed for the cooperation and coordination of these agencies, something that was missing before this Phoenix program was instituted. This was done by having every organization involved in a district work inside the DIOC and having all of them work together as a unified team with, within a single building, usually located within the district compound. Each DIAC building had a uniform layout consisting of three rooms, an archive where dossiers and plans were kept securely, a communications room where open and secure communications equipment was maintained, and an operations room where the various representatives worked and coordinated the effort to identify and target the VCI. The DIAC was staffed 24 seven, and each morning there was a meeting with the district chief to bring him up to speed on the progress of the previous day and any plans for future operations and any arrest orders that needed to be issued. Arrest orders were not approved without evidence and each arrest order had to be signed by either the district chief himself or a local legal magistrate. There's a misconception among many, including many academics, that these, there were no arrest orders issued. And I'm, I can tell you for a fact that I never had a, a single uh, operation conducted without an arrest order signed by uh, 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 district chief or a magistrate. Some critics of the Pro Phoenix program have alleged that it was an, quote, assassination program, unquote. But my experience with this ref refutes this contention. I was never, never ordered to kill anyone and neither were the men under my control, either officially or unofficially. I was always given an arrest order, since it made far more sense to capture a VCI than to kill him. The emphasis was on capturing the VCI so they could be exploited for, for intelligence or even turned. <clears throat> this slide identifies the members of a typical DIOC. As you can see, the representatives on the DIOC were diverse, and I'll briefly describe who they were and what they did. First, there's the district chief, chaired the Phoenix committee, and made all the decisions pertaining to arrests. If the district chief was a good man, took his job seriously, and was not corrupt, the Phoenix committees worked perfectly. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the district chiefs were rather young and inexperienced uh, military officers in the rank of captain and major. But many of them were chosen because they had exceptional abilities. In my, in, in my case, I found that four of my, uh, or two of my uh, four district chiefs were exceptional individuals and did a good job, and the other four were adequate. They weren't bad. The District S2 chief was responsible for the 24-7 administration of the DIOC. In terms you might understand, he was the operations chief for the DIOC. He handled everything from uh, mimeograph machines and typewriters to making sure that there was enough paper to be uh, used for dossiers. The American District Phoenix advisor was the only American on the committee, and he was responsible for advising the district chief on all matters pertaining to security in the district, 
and helped the district chief coordinate with the American Provincial Advisory Team. The National Police Representative passed on any intelligence developed by the police. The police were focused on normal police activities, but they had many informants among criminals in the district, and these informants often possessed information on the communists, since the communists at times engaged in criminal activities themselves, such as extortion and smuggling. The National Police Special Branch Representative was the only member of the committee under CIA control. Ideally, they had penetrated the Viet Cong and controlled agents reporting on the political activities of the party. We can equate them to our own FBI Counterintelligence Division or the British MI5. The military liaison officer or officers were liaison officers from any U.S. Uh, Arvin or allied military units operating in the district. Their job was to make sure ongoing or planned military operations did not interfere with DIAC operations against the VCI and to provide logistic, logistical support when needed. The Arvin Military Security Service representative passed on any political intelligence the South Vietnamese military collected, especially captured documents or POW interrogation reports. The Revolutionary Development RD representative was a key member of the DIOX since the RD program was the primary means of bringing good governance to the villages. Normally, an RD team in a district consisted of 70 odd government workers with expertise in education, public works, public health, and security. Since they worked in the villages, they often developed intelligence on the communists that was provided by the villagers. They also conducted a national census which polled the, polled the villagers on their attitudes toward the communists and the Saigon government. This resulted in color-coded maps of every village that identified households that were either pro-VC or pro-GVN or neutral. Well, can I interrupt you? Yeah. I want to ask you a question here. Uh, mm -hmm. The American District uh, Phoenix advisor there uh, says MACV. I would guess that would be uh, a, a American military. It was, an Amer it was an American military advisor. Now, uh, the National Police Special Branch Representative, CIA. That was CIA, but not an American. That was a Vietnamese. Vietnamese CIA, okay. Vietnamese. Where did you come in and your job in this? Uh, I come in as the action arm of the DIAC, and I'll go into that a little bit later. Oh, okay. Uh, but uh, I, I, I was not part of a DIAC, but I was part of Phoenix. Okay. okay. All right, so. Okay, these maps greatly facilitated both surveillance and targeting by the DIOC, but this was before we had computers. So these ma maps had to be maintained in DIOC archives and going over them was also a very tedious labor intensive task. I can tell from personal experience, my uh, uh, interpreter and I often spent many, many hours going over these hand generated village maps, trying to develop targets based on the information these maps provided. We did it in a very hot, hot room. And uh, I can remember sweating onto these maps and staining them with my perspiration. Okay, the Chu Hoi representative was responsible for reporting on any intelligence generated by the Viet Cong who rallied to the Saigon government. These ralliers were often a very reliable source of intelligence on the identities of VCI. I would point out here that identifying VCI was a complicated task since the communists all had party names that differed from their real names, and they used, often used several different aliases. Matching these party names with aliases to an individual's real name was no easy task, but the DIAC was able to do that and kept in their archives a list of all these party names alongside the real name of the individual. Uh, just so you're out there, you're understanding the Chi Hoi. Uh, the Chi Hoi was former. Uh, North Vietnamese or the communist who switched sides and came over to the uh, South Vietnamese side. Uh, there was leaflets out and so forth. They were given money and uh, protection and so forth. But that's where the Chi Hoi representative came in. He was actually uh, someone that was at one time a member of the uh, uh, communist military in some way or another. So That's correct. And uh, the Chi Hoi's were valuable because once they were captured, they immediately were taken to uh, uh, something called a PIC, the Provincial Interrogation Center. And there they were processed and interrogated. And often at that time, they offered up a lot of 
actionable intelligence because it was it was they hadn't been hadn't left the uh, communist uh, unit uh, for very long, sometimes as little as 24 hours. Uh, so th they were able to to exploit the intelligence provided by them uh, quite effectively. Um, the Saigon government also had an information service representative. Uh, they played a minor role in the DIOC, but since they were responsible for propaganda, they needed to know what the uh, communist messaging, w messaging was so they could counter it and provoke, promote the government story using a host of media from television, films, radio, and theatrical entertainments. In addition to the DIAC, there was another element of, in Phoenix that was key to a success. It was the Provincial Reconnaissance Unit, or more commonly referred to as the PRU. The PRU were specifically used to arrest the communists, especially in areas that were controlled by the VC or far from secure areas. Crews came into being in 1967, and they operated in all 44 provinces of South Vietnam. When pacification duties were shifted from the CIA to MACV in 1964, two elements were not put under the administrative and operational control of the U.S. military. Those two elements, which remained under the CIA, were the special branch and the counter-terror teams, which were later subsumed into the PRU. Since these two organizations remained under the control of the CIA, a veil of secrecy surrounded them, and because of this, many falsehoods and misperceptions developed around both. Some of these misperceptions exist to this day, in large, in large measure due to the continued classification by the CIA of their operations. I mentioned earlier that pacification mission was given to the U.S. military because the CIA did not have the budget or the manpower to staff all the pacification programs. These shortfalls did not end when the U.S. military, military took over pacification. The CIA found it was very difficult to staff even the special branch in the PRU with case officers or paramilitary officers. So the special branch often had to rely on contract employees and military personnel to fill many positions. At peak manning, there were approximately 4,400 South Vietnamese and 80 Americans had signed to the PRU. Most of the Americans came from the U.S. Army Special Forces, the Marine Corps Force Reconnaissance Companies, and the Navy SEALs. The crews were highly successful in destroying the VC, VCI grip on the South Vietnamese rural population, although that success was not always uniform or consistent throughout the country. Despite these difficulties, the crew enjoyed the respect of both the enemy and the Saigon government. My own experience with the Phoenix program took place at the end of my second tour of duty in South Vietnam in the key strategic province of Tay Ninh, 72 kilometers northwest of the capital Saigon and on the border with Cambodia. Until 1967, when U.S. operations drove it out of South Vietnam into Cambodia, the central office of South Vietnam, known as Cosvin, was the command and control headquarters for the Communist National Liberation Front, front and it occupied War Zone C in this province. Coven, Cosvin, as you know, was responsible for the conduct of war by the North Vietnamese in most of the 44 provinces of South Vietnam. From September 1969 to June 1970, I was the Pru advisor in Tainan province, and my mission was to assist the Pru in neutralizing the communist leadership in that province. Who were the Pru in Tainan province? They were locally recruited South Vietnamese, all, almost all of them members of the Cao Dai religious sect, which had its holy see or Vatican in Tainan city. They were also highly experienced fighters, often having served in the Arvin Airborne, the U.S. Special Forces, the Viet Minh, and the Cao Dai militia. They were recruited, trained, equipped, and paid by the CIA. As their advisor, I lived and worked out of a villa in Tainan City that I shared with three CIA officers, the only ones in the province. I was the only American military person assigned to the CIA in the province. I accompanied the crew on many missions until early 1970, when General Abrams ordered that no U.S. military personnel could uh, go on missions with them. This was a big mistake. I don't have time to go in with it. 
with you now. You might be surprised to see the young man on the right, on the left-hand picture and on the left in the photo on the right, and compare him to the old man you see before you uh, giving this presentation. How are we organized? In a province with a population of nearly 400,000 people, the Peru only had 92 Vietnamese personnel and one American, me. Despite the small numbers, the Peru were able to make significant progress in the province, and it destroyed much of the communist organization in the province or driven their cadres into Cambodia by 1970. The organization of the various Peru units varied from each unit for each province with some as large as over 300 assigned, or as few as 50. Some units were kept at provincial level, and some were broken down and assigned to districts. In Tainan province, we had five teams of 18 men each, with one each in the four districts, and one team, called the city team, held at true headquarters that could reinforce a district team when needed. The city team was also responsible for the Tainan, for Tainan city and the Caldai Holy See. We were the only armed group allowed to enter the Holy See. The Peru headquarters was very small, with only the Peru chief and an operations officer. Because of this, I was often called upon to plan operations, conduct training, and conduct liaison with American military units in the province for various forms of support. <clears throat> Despite the small number of personnel in the Peru, they were highly successful and rated by both the South Vietnamese and the Americans as the most effective means of neutralizing the communist infrastructure. During the eight months I was assigned to the PR, PRU, we killed 28 communists, captured 60, and arranged for 65 to rally to the Saigon government. I don't have time to go into the Peru intelligence system in the province, but su suffice it to say that nearly 75% of all actual intelligence was gained from the Peru's own organic system. If you want, I can explain more of that in the Q&A. Now we get to the really important part of this lecture, the lessons learned from the Phoenix experience. A word of caution is necessary at this point. Uh, these lessons learned were a synthesis of my own experience with the program, albeit a short time, and the experience of many other Phoenix advisors and South Vietnamese participants I have interviewed over the years. First, it is essential to thoroughly analyze the political, social, cultural, historical, and military environment of the battle space prior to U.S. commitment. Any pacification strategy developed should have at its logical conclusion the decisive defeat of the enemy, not a stalemate. One should also understand that history tells us that 80% of insurgencies are defeated, and that on average, a pacification program takes at least eight years to be successful. In short, we need to be prepared for the long haul. There are no easy or quick fixes. Second, never assume you can win the hearts and minds of the nation you are assisting. That is the host government's duty. Remember the words of Lawrence of Arabia when he, British, when he briefed his British advisors during World War I. He said, it is their country and their war, and you are a foreigner, foreigner and your time is short. You need to take that advice to heart. Third, you need to find a way to minimize U.S. presence. You need to recruit locally and allow the host country to take the lead on pacification. If they can't do it, you know you're on a fool's errand. Fourth, employ U.S. military forces in roles they are best suited for. Do not assume that our soldiers and Marines can readily adapt, readily adapt to counterinsurgency operations. Leave police and pacification operations to the host nation and, US, and use the U.S. forces for kinetic actions against the enemy's conventional forces or in training and in a logistics role. Be especially careful about this pr profligate use of supporting arms when there is a possibility of harming the people you want to protect. This was a major failing in Vietnam and drove many villagers into the arms of the enemy. Fifth and probably most important lesson learned is to isolate the battle space if you're employing a strategy based upon attrition. Never allow your enemy to have sanctuaries and adjacent to the battle space. This was a major strategic flaw in the Vietnam War and it is still a major problem in Afghanistan. Sixth, you have, to have a successful pacification outcome, 
I re highly recommend the development and rapid implementation of an all-source targeting system that forces all the participants in the pacification effort to coordinate and coordinate a system, system similar to the Phoenix program. Finally, develop a police field force similar to Peru that is specifically and exclusively targeted, targeted against the political leadership insurgency and not diverted to other missions. Uh, I have a couple of questions. The, um, when, so when you talk about, everybody heard of the Phoenix program. I have talked to, it was always, uh, well, they're an assassination group. Yeah. But uh, a while ago when you said how many you captured, how many you uh, converted, uh, was much, much higher than the ones you actually had to, had to kill. I mean, there's some you're not going to ever be able to kill. So when you say neutralization, uh, you, you're not just, neutralization is not just uh, going out and shooting somebody. It is. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a term that, unfortunately, a lot of people who are against uh, our presence in Vietnam uh, ascribed a, a negative to it. Neutralization simply means you are eliminating the threat. And that can be done through killing, capturing, proselytizing, bringing them in. It can be done anyway. Yeah. Well, you know, when you talk about we were at war mm -hmm. uh, and the idea was to kill the enemy. And uh, it, it, so... Uh, uh, when you start thinking about assassination groups uh, and so forth, which uh, the Phoenix program uh, obviously uh, was not our, an assassination group per se, but, uh, but well, let me let me get, let me give you let me give you some some groups on that because right. um, even some people who should know better are called an assassination program. Uh, when it was originally formed by the CIA, there were counter terrorist teams. A mistake was made by the CIA. Uh, mainly because they didn't have enough people really to manage the program properly. Uh, a lot of counterterrorism teams brought Viet Cong ralliers into the program. Uh, this was problematic because they want two reasons. One is they brought along a, a lot of bad habits. Uh, they were not adverse to killing people. And two, because they were rallied to the government, they were viewed as traitors by the communists. So if you capture a Viet Cong and you put him in jail and he's talking to his family, Word gets out, and the, the, pretty soon the armed propaganda teams visit the families of these PRUs that are, or these people that were working for us, and they kill them. And this, I know for a fact, happened. One of my, one of my team leaders had his entire family wiped out uh, because of that. Um, so after 1968 or early 68, a decision was made by the CIA not to hire any more former Viet Cong because they were the ones that were primarily causing causing the damage. Uh, so also, there were some instances, primarily in i Corps, of uh, province chiefs using the PRUs for things other than what they were intended. And they would use them against their own political uh, uh, adversaries. In, up in i Corps, the VNQDD and the Dai Viet political parties were often at odds. And the province chief in Quang Nam province was a Dai Viet. And he used the PRUs to go out and arrest VNQ, QDD political people. Uh, we called the Quang Nam Pru the bad boys of the program. And you have to be honest here, a lot of the bad reputation that the Pru's got came from this one province. Uh, twice they had to be disbanded because of their, their bad, bad conduct. And one time, the CIA officer, he was, a C, he was a real CIA officer who was in charge of them, pulled them in a, in a, in a company formation, told them they were all fired. Now, that was a mistake because they shot him in the legs. And I, he was lucky to get away with his life. Uh, they were bad. The Guangdong province crew were bad. But on balance, most of the PRUs were quite good. And where you had a good province chief, you didn't have these kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't recruit my, I didn't, didn't have a single Viet Cong, former Viet Cong in my PRU. They were all primarily, uh, I would say 98% Cal Dai religious adherents. And because of that, they had a lot of credibility in the province. They knew the province intimately. I think we had two Catholics and two Buddhists out of 92. I think a lot of people don't realize that the Peru <laughs> units and so forth and some of the other units had their families right there with them uh, when they were fighting. And so uh, it was easy for a family to be subject to uh, special punishment by the Viet Cong because of their involvement. Uh, you said a while ago something uh, doing the uh, things we learned. 
Uh, I think part of the problems we had was the whiz kids that ran the war out of D.C. never bothered to understand the Vietnamese uh, culture or their religious uh, things. It's it's like the, uh, the relocation program to create the free fire zones. They would move entire families never thinking about the fact that they were a Buddhist and Buddhist uh, is a big family thing, and they move right back into the areas that they didn't move from. Uh, it's like the whiz kids uh, use their computers how to run the war, but never really looked into uh, the Vietnamese culture. And I think that caused a lot of our uh, problems with winning the hearts and minds of the well, Vietnamese they, people. They, they weren't the only ones. The, the U.S. military was guilty of a lot of bad training. Uh, the idea that uh, they would tell uh, soldiers and Marines going to into country that uh, everybody in a village is probably a communist and you can't trust anybody and, and um, you know, don't, uh, don't have anything to do with the, the Vietnamese. Um, that was a mistake. Um, uh, fortunately, when I had an infantry company, I had uh, some Chu Hoi working with me, Kit Carson Scouts, and I had them conduct classes on, you know, what, what the average villager was dealing with. And um, they became much more sensitive to uh, the villagers. The villagers, really, a lot of them were just caught in the middle between yeah. the communists. And, and the use of the profligate use of American firepower is a real detriment, too. Uh, we had too many people calling in airstrikes and using uh, artillery in a in a profligate manner, and it you know you kill water buffaloes, you piss off people. Uh, uh, if people have to live in bunkers at night because you're firing H and I fires, and a lot of these things were done had no no result whatsoever other than turning the population against us. So uh, we need to do a much better job anytime we go in. Uh, to a, a country to make sure our people are sensitive to the culture and the history of the people that we're trying to protect. I think that was one of the <laughs> the, uh, the, the strengths of the Prue program as well as the Cap, Cap Marines program because <laughs> the Cap Marines program had uh, uh, Marines would actually live in the villages uh, with the people and so forth and uh, get to know them and their culture and, and actually uh, be a, vill a villager to a certain extent. And, uh, I, I think that was one of the mistakes that Westmoreland had uh, when he started putting up these little little uh, a little fire bases scattered all over every place that you could hardly uh, take care of rather than trying to win the hearts and minds of the people a little bit. Well, in his defense, in Westmoreland's defense, he was tasked with an almost impossible situation. He had control only of South Vietnam and North Vietnam. He did not have any control over Laos and Cambodia, which are controlled by the U.S. State Department. And they were off limits completely because of the uh, Geneva Accords on the neutrality of Laos and Cambodia. Now, the North Vietnamese didn't adhere to those, but we did because the State Department had a vested interest in, in uh, maintaining control in those two countries. Well, you know, a rational mind says, <clears throat> hey, they, they're going in that country and breaking, breaking it. That, that means that there is no more, no more treaty there. And we can go in and, and take we care. Should have. We should have had at least the uh, right to uh, pursue them uh, in, in, in there. The, the Americans, because Westmoreland was given both pacification and going after main, main force units, he never really had enough people to do both. And uh, American forces would, would have been much better employed to be employed in the northern part of the country and into Laos and cut those two choke points, one at... Uh, Chapone and the other in the Four Corners area, southern Laos. If you cut those areas and and prevented them from bringing in their troops and supplies, you would have lowered the level of violence in South Vietnam considerably. But we misemployed American forces. They were misemployed, and uh, our military leadership uh, probably should have resigned over it because they knew as early as 1962 that if you did not cut the Ho Chi Minh Trail in southern Laos, it was almost impossible for the South Vietnamese to prevail. It's, it's hard to believe that we, you know, all the bombs and stuff we dropped and we just, and it never, yeah. never really did it because we were not allowed to go over, you know, but from the military uh, soldier's point of view, uh, the soldier was very frustrated, mm -hmm. like Hamburger Hill, where you were going in and we lost all these men taking it. And then we walk away. Quezon, we fought that for 77 days and then walked away. 
why did my buddy die? Yeah. Well, that's, that's the whole problem with you don't achieve a decisive result. You're expecting people to fight for a stalemate. And people don't want to fight for a stalemate. They want to fight for victory. And uh, you're going to have morale problems. You're going to have uh, people questioning the legitimacy of your strategy. And quite right, rightly so. The American strategy in Vietnam was uh, seriously, seriously flawed. And we knew it, but uh, we just could never change it. And for political reasons, uh, it was too late when Nixon came in to really do anything about it. Well, you know, I, there's a lot of, I talked to a lot of uh, uh, American soldiers, and they have a very bad uh, thought pattern, we'll say, on, for, towards the Vietnamese. But I think that goes back to their own frustration. And they took out some of their frustration on the South Vietnamese and the villagers uh, and so forth because yeah. they were uh, frustrated. And as we talked about a while ago, uh, someone in D.C. decided this was a friendly village and this was a bad village. And you weren't supposed to do anything about, about the friendly village uh, at all, but you go into the bad village and they treat you good, and the friendly village could treat you bad. But DC, I mean, DC decided otherwise. So, uh, in hindsight, Americans would have been much better served if they stayed out of the villages. If they went in there, they should have gone in like caps. But the American forces were, mis like I say, misemployed. Search and destroy operations don't achieve anything if you still have the sanctuaries and the enemy can reinforce and resupply. That's a fundamental military uh, 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 doctrine that was disregarded by the Americans, mainly because of our hubris. We thought that we could uh, uh, kill our way out of it by you know, uh, attriting the, uh, the enemy forces, but you can't attrit if, unless you have a solid, solid state battle space. We didn't have that. We allowed the enemy to have the ability to, to mass all along the uh, western border of South Vietnam and move in and out uh, at, you know, without any real problems. Uh, that, that was a really dumb way to fight. I hope the Americans never fight another war like that, although I see echoes of it in Afghanistan. You know, for the people out there <clears throat> watching, it's about basically you draw a line in the sand and you can't cross that line, but they can jump back and forth all they want to, sure. and you can't cross that line. It's, a, it's like they're having a wall there. And you can't go over, but they can. It's it, it makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, our next show will be with George Williams, uh, who was in Vietnam early on, and uh, back then you could move around Vietnam safely and uh, and securely. Uh, I remember going to uh, before Tet and so forth. I would get in a jeep, go to uh, uh, Bearcat, the ninth uh, ninth infantry place, and go to the PX and so forth and. A lot of times they didn't take a rifle with me, uh, but after Tet, uh, it definitely changed. Let me tell you a little things that are going on. On 26th of January <coughs> is the Vietnamese American Association Raleigh is holding their Tet Festival at the Raleigh, uh, Raleigh or the State Capitol uh, Fairgrounds at Dorton Arena. Uh, it starts from 11, goes to 4 o'clock, and if you're in the area, I highly recommend you come over and uh, eat some Vietnamese food. See some beautiful young Vietnamese ladies walking around in their aldies. And uh, if you got children, bring them with you for the dragon dance and so forth. So that is uh, uh, January 26th, which happens to be this coming Sunday. Uh, February 1st, uh, if you're in the Raleigh area, the monthly POWMI ceremony at the state capitol has been going on for about 33 years now. It's at 12 o'clock noon. It's a very moving ceremony. You ought to attend that. And uh, as a public service announcement, I'd like to let all the men out there rem uh, remind you that the 14th is Valentine's Day. Don't procrastinate. Uh, again, thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you February 12th. Thank you, and good night. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.